Welcome and good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is Andrew Fawcett. I'm a senior counsel with Altamere's technology, media and telecommunications practice. Um, so why are we doing this webinar today and, and why this topic? Here in the Gulf region, like everywhere else, uh, we're becoming increasingly digitized. And I, I even think that this current situation appears to be a watershed for this as well. Look at the way we're currently interacting. Um, but with this, there also becomes a greater vulnerability to cyber threats. Bahrain in particular is a financial hub and is allied to the US and Saudi Arabia, which seems to make it a, a bit of a focus. So it's important for enterprises to be able to identify the security gaps. I'm really pleased to be running this webinar with uh, Ankura Consulting. Uh, when you're talking about cybersecurity as professionals, we need to talk about cross disciplines and a holistic view. Look, as a lawyer, I can tell you that the law requires you to provide an appropriate level of security, taking into account the state of the art, but I can't tell you exactly what best in industry practice currently is. And this is where Ankara can come in. So I'm now going to introduce you to Norris, who's Ankara's Managing Director of their Technology Privacy and Cyber Risk Advisory Practice. Norris is, is moderating the session today. Uh, welcome, Norris, and handing over to you. Thank you so much, Andrew, for the kind introduction. Uh, a very good morning, everyone from London. A very good afternoon for those who are listening from Dubai and uh, also from Bahrain and anywhere in the GCC region. Uh, so as a moderator for today, um, in terms of the flow of the webinar, we aim to achieve 45 minutes of the webinar presentation and uh, followed by uh, 50 minutes Q&A. So on the go to the webinar platform, uh, you can see questions uh, uh, icon where if you have any questions, just uh, write a question and uh, we will actually aim to answer uh, some of the questions that you have. But uh, in the interest of time, we will cherry pick you know, the relevant questions and uh, we will follow up the remaining questions directly to you, whether it is uh, very legal in nature, we will uh, reach out to uh, Andrew to follow up with you. And if the questions are very operational from the cyber or privacy side, the Ankara team will provide the answers as a follow-up conversation. So uh, with me today, we have Andrew Catley, Director of uh, Cyber Security of EMEA in Ankara, and uh, Gavin McKay, uh, Director for Cyber Security EMEA, and last but not least, Amber Gosney, she's a Senior Director for Technology, Privacy and Cyber Risk Advisory EMEA practice. Uh, so uh, as a big background of myself, I'm leading the UK, Europe, and supporting the Asia data privacy practice in Ankara and uh, delivered around 180 projects, a uh, global program, privacy program, not just GDPR, but also CCPA and also some of the Asia and as well as uh, risk-based approach uh, kind of projects in the GCC region. And uh, so without further ado, let me start with the uh, bird's eye view. So Andrew, I know that uh, you have been uh, uh, talking about and sharing the latest insights about the Bahrain uh, personal uh, data protection law. I remember last year when I was in Dubai uh, to, throughout the roundtable uh, conversation with clients and organizations in Dubai, uh, some of the questions that we received is about Bahrain. And what I learned from the conversation is that uh, Bahrain's new law on the personal uh, protection of data was published on 19 July 2018 and it came into effect on 1st August 2019. And Andrew, is there any development since then? Perhaps you can share with the audience. So um, can we move on to the next slides? And uh, next slide, please. So the Bahrain's personal data protection law is um, a significant new data protection law in the region. It's the, the first really to follow the revised General Data Protection Directive in, in the EU. Now, uh, firstly, 
just just a, a thing with terminology. When we're talking about cybersecurity or information security, we're talking about all data, not just personal data. A personal data is data about a, a identifiable individual. But for Bahrain, the the personal data protection law is a game changer, and I just want to take you through that. So th there's a little bit of confusion in, in the market. The law is in force. It came into effect on 1 August 2019. Um, and the Ministry of Justice, on an interim basis, has uh, assumed the powers and duty of the Personal Data Protection Authority under that law. Where the confusion stems from is that although the law is in force, it's not currently fully effective because um, there needs to be implementing regulations uh, for many of the provisions of the law. How, however, that said, there are critical provisions, which I'm about to discuss, which are in effect that don't need further regulations. Next slide. So of these provisions, uh, when we're talking about cybersecurity, um, Article 8, uh, which uh, concerns security of processing, uh, is critical. Now, what that law says is that data controllers um, basically have to apply technical and organisational measures capable of protecting data uh, against unintentional or unauthorised uh, disclosure access. Now, these measures, uh, these measures have to be capable of providing an appropriate level of security, taking account state of the art, cost of inflammation, and the actual context and purposes of, of the processing. So there is some qualification there. But again, the what the law requires as of now, the technical and organizational measures have to be written and they have to be available. Further, under the law, there is scope for the Personal Data Protection Authority to issue regulations specifying exact security requirements. Uh, I'm not sure when those will come in or whether that they are likely. Um, personally, I have some preference that they don't necessarily go that particular. Um, and then we can basically look at what the, the industry best practice is. Next slide. So, the other part of the security of processing is if, if you are processing data but outsource that processing to a third party, a, a data processor, you, you now have to have a written contract um, with that data, data process and it has to stipulate at least two things required by the law and that they'll only engage in processing in accordance with your instructions and they will comply with the same security and confidentiality requirements that are imposed on you as the data controller. In addition, the law says that a data controller can only select the data processor who provides sufficient guarantees regarding their security measures. And the data controller is required to take reasonable steps to verify that the data processor is complying with those security measures. So you need to get guarantees and look at having an order. Next slide. There's, uh, under the new law, there's no actual express concept of a, a data breach um, incident reporting, uh, as you might find in other jurisdictions. However, where it comes in, there is a role under the law of a, a data protection supervisor or guardian depending on the uh, uh, version of the law you're looking at. Now, uh, this role isn't exactly the same as a data protection officer in uh, other privacy laws. It's um, basically a role that uh, is intermediary between the data protection authority and the data controller. The, the role of the data protection supervisor is basically to verify the, uh, that the data controller is processing data in accordance with the law. Now, if the supervisor has evidence of a breach, then they've got to notify the data controller to remove the cause of the breach. And if they don't do that, then they are uh, to notify the authority. 
So there's this instant breach can come in under this. However, right now, it's not mandatory for anyone to appoint a data protection supervisor. Um, it may be that the authority will identify that there are particular sectors that will require to have a data protection supervisor. So as it stands, you don't have to have a supervisor and there is this, not this requirement for the supervisor to report. Next slide. Where the authority does investigate, then they've got power to issue administrative penalties. Um, and I've set, uh, set them out in the, in the slide here, and these are without prejudice to civil or criminal li li liability. Now, these uh, penalties basically uh, don't exceed um, uh, 20,000 an hour. Uh, and just want to give you some context with the GDPR, where, uh, you know, obviously 50, uh, 53,000 US dollars is not an insignificant amount, but by comparison to the GDPR, the fines is the higher, can be the higher of 20 million euros or 4% of annual turnover. The critical thing is on the next slide. So the next slide, please. The, the law introduces new criminal offences and civil liability. Now, the criminal offences in the nature of, of a data breach in the instant are probably only around failure to notify the authority if required or providing false information. What is critical for businesses to understand now is that the, the PDPL codifies a right of, of civil compensation from someone who suffered uh, from the violation of the laws. So if you haven't provided adequate technical or organizational measures for security of your processing, you can be exposed to civil claims. So that's setting the scene in terms of what the PDPL int uh, introduces in, in the context of Bahrain. I'll now hand over to the uh, Ankura team. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Andrew, for the comprehensive overview of uh, the Bahrain uh, legal uh, landscape. Uh, Andrew, before I actually hand over to uh, Andy, uh, just a quick question from my side. Uh, I know that when we look into some of the provisions of the Bahrain law, uh, partly it mirrors GDPR and partly it has its own unique identity and flavor for the uh, Bahrain landscape. Uh, in your view, after having looked into all of these provisions and how the market react, do you think that you know the market just need to wait and see, or is very timely for the market to start to do necessary you know assessment or as well as review of their current policies and procedures and agreements? Yeah, um, honestly, the um, some sectors have been good, others haven't. Some have been taking a wait and wait and see. Um, I very much, it's not too late. Um, I very much encourage uh, the, the market, the, as I say, the, the law is in force. There's, there's particular parts that are important. This um, Article 8, which I've gone through, there's also the other parts with the transparency requirements under the law, uh, the need to inform people uh, about the data that you're collecting and how, how you're dealing with it. Um, so the, um, pickup has been uh, slow in some sectors. I think this is because some of the confusion about whether the law is um, is fully enforced or not. But really, businesses in Bahrain are subject to it and should be doing something about it. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Andrew, for the um, prompt uh, answer. So let us go to the Ankara side. Um, let me start with this uh, setting. Um, Anchor is a firm we have actually seen a lot of uh, global, you know, data breaches, and as well as global uh, privacy challenges, and as well as issues uh, around the world. So uh, the way we actually uh, uh, experience this is very much based on sectors, and as well as how exactly those organisations prioritise their activities and their budget when it comes to. Uh, rolling out a uh, certain uh, cyber security and data privacy governance program. So before I give this session to uh, Andy, uh, so what we're seeing in the market is that GDPR has actually triggered 
a global, you know, uh, privacy kind of a push to most markets, not just the US uh, in the context of uh, California, the California Consumer Privacy Act, for example, but also to uh, certain jurisdictions in the GCC region and as well as APEC, particularly in Singapore, uh, the Philippines, uh, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, and uh, Hong Kong, even in China. So um, one of the key provisions that are very, very uh, important in the respective jurisdictions is on uh, data breaches. I know Andrew mentioned about the fact that in the current Bahrain law, there is no requirement to notify the authority whenever there's a breach. So Andrew, can you share you know, your perspectives and some of the data that Ancora has collected around the world with regards to some of the global projects that we have delivered so far, so that the Bahrain market can learn how to contextualize it within you know, the local market. Please, Andrew. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Norris. Uh, good morning, afternoon or evening, uh, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Uh, so quick intro to myself. Uh, uh, as Norris said, I'm a, I'm a director in the cybersecurity team at Ancura. I've uh, been consulting in the cybersecurity space for, for a while and have a background in uh, undertaking incident response investigations, doing penetration testing and uh, some risk advisory stuff. And prior to that, I spent 14 years in the Metropolitan Police as a police officer, uh, undertaking many and varied criminal investigations. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? So uh, as you'll see on the, on the next few slides that, that I've put together, uh, the figures evidence what is already widely known, and, and that is uh, that there is and continues to be an up trend in the number of cyber related breaches and uh, the costs associated with them. Now, a quick caveat here, I, I have to say, uh, obviously these figures change, uh, you know, on a regular basis, such as the fluidity and, and intensity of, cyber crime, of the cyber crime landscape at the moment. Uh, these figures are mostly uh, drawn from US data, uh, just because that's where the majority of, uh, of the data is available from. So there's two statistics here that I wanted to draw your attention to specifically. The first one is the average cost of a breach in 2019 was nearly $4 million. Obviously not an insignificant uh, sum. And we'll discuss in later slides how some of the costs can be mitigated or, or, or reduced. The second is the average time it takes to effectively deal with a breach, um, nine months uh, on average to identify the intrusion and contain it. As you can see here, this is broken down uh, to 206 days on average from the point an attacker has gained access to the networks uh, and the data they're in. We call this in the industry dwell time, uh, that, that being the, the amount of time the attackers had to kind of wander around your, your infrastructure. And then a further 73 days on average to investigate and contain the breach. Uh, in its entirety. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> what, what, what does this all mean? Uh, ultimately, the, the headline figure um, is, as you can see on the slide, $6 trillion. Uh, it's forecast to be annually by 2021, and that's up from $3 trillion in 2015. Uh, this is the, the total cost of cyber crime when factoring, factoring in all uh, repercussions and effects of suffering a breach. Uh, and, and that includes, as you can see on the slide, that includes uh, those intangible effects that are very hard to quantify in monetary terms, such as reputational harm and, and the financial implications of the damage and destruction of data. Next slide, please. So in looking at and considering the previous statistics, you know, we have to ask the question, what, why, why, why is it, why, why is the trend always up? Why, why, why does it keep happening? But there are many reasons, uh, too many to, to list it in, in one session, I, I would uh, suppose, but, uh, We've picked out a few salient points that we feel illustrate the issues most. 
And on, on this slide, you can see, I, I think the most, the most standout figure for me is uh, the fact that 70% of data breaches are caused by people and process failures. Uh, 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 on the slide, that's, that's called avoidable failures. And as, as they say, knowledge is power. Uh, and those companies that have effective uh, you know, staff awareness and training programs in terms of cybersecurity will reduce this figure within their business significantly. Those companies that have in place and stress test on a regular basis, uh, security programs that encompass effective policy and procedure design and implementation will also be well on the way to mitigating those avoidable failures. Next slide, please. So, so, you know, how do we address how do we address the risk, and what can we do? Uh, the development and implementation of an incident response plan can reduce the cost of a breach by over one million dollars. Uh, you see in the purple box there the the, the, the facts around that, um, <clears throat> and that's just one that's just one kind of one sort of mitigation step step uh, you know that can reduce the cost significantly. At Ancura, we help companies on a daily basis with their cybersecurity programs, developing roadmaps for change and improvement, which encompass the whole of the cyber, cyber landscape. Uh, this includes governance, risk mitigation, controls development, security testing, breach preparedness, and investigations. This process begins with consultation and engagement to understand where you want to get to and what your targets are uh, and indeed what success looks like uh, for you as a company. Uh, then an assessment to know where you currently are in terms of maturity and what needs to be done to get you to that end goal. Uh, a roadmap you know, will be drawn up in consultation with the business. And Ancura's cybersecurity and data privacy teams will work together to deliver a project which will secure your systems and data and, and give you that resilience uh, that's required to stand up to regulatory scrutiny. Uh, I, I, all, all of these slides going back uh, and these statistics, you know, they, they reflect what, uh, what Andrew was saying in his piece earlier. Uh, in that it's very important to be proactive in implementing your cybersecurity program before uh, the regulations you know, start to be enforced in any, any meaningful way. Thanks, Norris. Right, thanks so much, um, Andy, for the, uh, the data that you have shared uh, with the audience. Uh, before I go to Gavin, I have one question to you, Andy. Uh, you mentioned about all of this data. Uh, I know that data is very much very US driven. And uh, of course, in the GCC region, uh, there's still no data yet, which I hope that we aim to actually, you know, collate the data in the next uh, few months or perhaps in the next few years, once the GC development will, will be enforced in the next few years. So um, a while ago, Andrew mentioned about the security of processing technical and organizational measures under Article 8, Clause 1. And he also mentioned briefly about the data process obligations. So it, Andy, in your experience, whenever there is actually a breach, right, or who are exactly the key buyers, the key team members that needs to get involved? And do you think that, you know, the investment, again, okay, should be done at the early part, you know, rather than when the breach happened? The reason why I ask this is a very fundamental question is that, um, uh, when I observe, you know, the GC region market, I realize that there's a mixed kind of approach, uh, the proactive approach, who actually, you know, really replicate the global best practice model. And then there's a reactive approach where uh, the wait and see, uh, they just want to understand the current risk posture, risk priorities, and to prioritize some of the activities on, on the other compliance aspect. So do you think that, you know, a, a sizable kind of investment in view of the company's business, uh, company's operations, whether the company says cloud infrastructure, whether the company transfer data worldwide from Bahrain to the rest of the world, uh, they should put that investment in advance? Or do you think that the investment should be prioritized and reprioritized based on what the business is actually, you know, um, um, expanding and prioritizing? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> I, I think I'll answer that in, in two parts. So. Essentially, the, the first part is, uh, you know, around being uh, around being proactive with 
with, with your controls and, and your overall cybersecurity program. You know, ultimately, in, in our experience, at Anchor are carrying out investigations. Those companies that have, um, you know, planned for the worst, uh, they, they see a huge benefit in, in, in monetary terms and also in, in downtime and, um, you know, operationally uh, being able to get, get back up and running uh, when they have these, you know, kind of plans in place. Um, they they they're able to activate uh, you know the whole plan or, or certain parts of the plan uh, as and when needed uh, uh, and it it means for us as investigators when when we're investigating the breach that uh, we are able to get uh, you know access to relevant data that we're analysing um, you know in a timely fashion and, and the investigation on a whole. Uh, run, runs a lot smoother and and is more efficient. Uh, I think the second part, the, the second uh, answer uh, or part to the question is uh, around, you know, who who kind of matters. I mean, it, in our experience, um, you know, obviously a lot of our breaches are are UK based or or uh, European based, and <clears throat> so in the UK, if I take that as an example. Uh, when when companies have to, uh, it becomes evident that, that there's been a breach and there is a, a risk to to data, uh, or data has been exposed. Um, they, they will, you know, be advised by their legal teams to to make a notification to the ICO, the UK-based regulator. Uh, and in our experience in dealing with the ICO, um, they always, I think it's safe to say 100% of the time, they always look favorably on those companies um, that show that they have been uh, proactive in, in their cybersecurity kind of uh, programs uh, leading, leading up to the breach. So it makes, a, it, it does make a huge difference as well as to, as to how the, you know, your interaction with the regulator goes. Uh, so yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Andy, for uh, the, the answer. So, uh, Gavin, um, can you share with the audience uh, with regards to, you know, a case study or more from the threat intelligence side, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Norris, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gavin Mackay. I, I too, uh, work as a director at Ankura within the cybersecurity practice dealing with incident response matters that are referred into us on, on a daily basis. Um, today, I, I'd like the opportunity to uh, share a, a ransomware case study, uh, which is a matter we dealt with uh, at Ankura uh, earlier this year. And really, it, it's to discuss ransomware and, and the key matter is that the fear of data exfiltration and reporting as, as Andrew men Andy mentioned uh, to our data regulator the information commission office we, we call it the ICO um, but there are parallels with your own legislation uh, the PDPL which Andrew has, uh, has has discussed earlier on in this webinar so let me let me cut to the scenario. Uh, so we were engaged to investigate a ransomware attack aimed at a UK company uh, with an annual turnover or in excess of 1.5 million sterling. The actors had executed the attack, uh, but against the third party IT company, the data pr processor for our client encrypting their network and forcing both the third party and our client offline. The threat actors, believing that they had netted a, a, a high worth target, uh, immediately demanded £300,000 uh, to be provided to provide the decryption keys and enable the company to get back up and running. So, we were, we were engaged. Uh, the third party data processor also engaged uh, a separate company uh, 
to conduct incident response. We and Cura conducted incident response investigation on behalf of the client. And, and our key uh, structure for that investigation was to confirm if the attack initiated within the data processors network and that the clients, our clients' credentials were not mean not used as a means to gain access to the data processors network. And to follow on from that, to conduct forensic analysis, to identify if the threat actors had moved laterally across and penetrated the client's local network. Um, it was within that local network that, that the crown jewels of data, um, if, if you will, uh, were located and, and clearly a major concern for our client, and, and that was a key, a key factor of our investigation. And from there, we were looking to identify the threat actors and monitor their activity. And to do that, we would use uh, threat intelligence to see if we could identify them and, and monitor their activities. And, and lastly, it was to establish if any data or credentials had actually been exfiltrated um, from our client network. So we pressed on with that investigation. And if we could come on to the next slide, please. So our actions. We deployed immediately and remotely to obtain triage data from the multiple, multiple domain servers that uh, were identified through our scoping uh, engagement with the client. And, I, and I'll say from the outset um, that is the uh, was an example of how how flexible uh, and quickly Ancura can move in in dealing with uh, incident response and particularly ransomware matters. We remotely get the triage scripts over, and and by that uh, we were able to get the analysis kicked off, uh, and we were able to report in quick time back to the client confirming that no breach data loss had been detected on a local network. Now, at the same time, the third parties, uh, the data processor was uh, conducting their own investigation and, and we had offered uh, and made a gesture to work together uh, for the betterment of, of both parties. Uh, however, that was refused, and, and that caused undue delay in the investigation. Uh, and, and why I mention that at this point is to cross-reference with, with, with Andy's presentation previous to this, in that that caused delay, uh, and there may have been very good reasons for it um, on the third-party data processor side, but it drove up the cost, and, and you will be aware of the, the high costs of uh, cyber uh, dealing with cyber incidents and it drove the cost up and there was undue delay. So I'll come back to uh, the actions uh, and whilst we had made initial triage um, findings, there was a however, because we identified a suspicious admin account which had attempted to move laterally on its network. And in particular, we'd identified what one uh, one domain server, uh, and we to to be thorough, we recommended a, a deeper dive forensic analysis on that domain controller. So we, we did that, uh, and we 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 conducted a a full deep dive analysis, and from that we we uncovered several admin accounts created by the threat actor. And they did and confirmed that they had attempted uh, an importance, uh, and I underline that attempted to gain access, uh, albeit unsuccessfully, to the client's network. So from there, by by going further and deeper into into the incident, we were able to provide assurance to the client that there was no further need for them to disclose make a disclosure to the UK. Uh, Data Commissioner, the ICO or the Information Commissioner's Office. 
um, you know, and that is a key point uh, to this. And again, ties in with Andy's presentation. The more upfront, the more honest uh, and detailed you are from an early point with the ICO, um, the, the more understanding and the less likely uh, are you to be fined or, or um, dealt with by the ICO because you have engaged from the outset. Uh, and it, it's a key takeaway and, and it's happened uh, or we've experienced this on many, many occasions uh, in, in the course of investigations. And, and coming on to the last action um, was leveraging our threat intelligence service um, to monitor darknet and, and hacking forums for chatter relating to our client, the third party. And, and from that, we were able to identify threat actors um, based in Russia and on a Russian hacking forum discussing the, the attack on a closed forum. Uh, and from that, we were able to uh, draw down those conversations uh, and review them. And what we found, the attackers were discussing how they were unable to move laterally from the from the third party data processors onto our clients local network and, and again i was we were able to provide assurance to the client from these chats and it also corroborated and confirmed our own forensic findings and, and that they were unable to breach but interestingly the, the, what we did discern from these chats was that the threat actors had bought the uh, map of the third party's network for $400. And that network had been, had been mapped out by a, a rogue uh, threat actor and sold on uh, for that sum of money, $400. Uh, and with a caveat that the, the, the person who'd mapped the network, who'd penetrated it and sold it on, would be paid a 25% of any ransom generated. So the key takeaways uh, from that, uh, fr from this investigation and this example, uh, is, is that collaboration is key. It speeds up the investigation process. In this instance, we weren't able to collaborate with the third party. Uh, they wanted to do it their way. Uh, it drove up the costs, it drove time, it un we wasted time in a, a, what is a key investigation. Um, and, and actually, it resulted in the third party uh, data processors contract being terminated for the security breach because the, the breach was clearly at their, at their end of the network and they did not disclose that fully to our client. So in terms of um, similarities with PDPL legislation, it, it failed to provide security and confidentiality. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So this slide relates to threat intelligence. And uh, uh, what it is, it is we use it with incidents, uh, to complement uh, dealing with uh, cyber attacks uh, and to, to s try and identify uh, leak credentials or, or threat actors discussing it. Uh, and we continuously monitor, monitor threat intelligence in the form of operational intelligence. Uh, and we'll, it, it's, it allows us to be have a presence on the deep dark web forums, hacking websites, and quickly identify data which may be released so that we can then plan and alert our clients uh, to, to the risks of exposure, exposure um, and plan and prepare for, for such eventualities. Um, we do that by leveraging 
high value keywords to create triggers so that we can put our client on the front foot in terms of uh, having having that threat intelligence capability and being able to plan and prepare against any attacks. And what I would like to do is I'd like to be able to answer any questions you may have later on in the, in the process. But uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to my, my presentation. Wonderful. Norris. Thank you so much, Gavin, for the <clears throat> case study. So, uh, Andrew, uh, uh, for Alta Mimi's side, uh, there's a question for you. Uh, the question is, in view of PDPL law number 13, 2018, what are the employer requirements for employee data protection at a very, very high level? So, so um, with the PDPL, the transparency requirements, which is basically um, by transparency, I mean, the, the law imposes um, obligations on data controllers to tell data subjects uh, what information they're collecting about them and how they're going to use that, and also tell them about this, the statutory rights that um, they are now provided under the law. So the, um, any employee, uh, sorry, any employer should be doing that with its employees. And it's a, it's a notice and it's providing the information. But that's one side of it. And then the, the flip side of it is that employers should also be looking at um, their, uh, their em employee code of conduct and uh, other organisational systems just to make sure that when employees are dealing with um, uh, uh, other people's information, they're complying with the law. So they're, they're the two main workflows to address with the PDPL, but then there, there are other aspects like the collection of, uh, of sensitive data and things like that. But at a very high level, uh, tell the employees what information you're collect about, uh, collecting about them and in compliance with the law, and then make sure that your employees are acting in accordance with the law with other people's data. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrew, for the comprehensive uh, answer. So for, for the questioner, if you would like to ask a much more detailed uh, uh, question or perhaps follow-up question, please feel reach out to uh, Andrew from Altamimi separately. Uh, he's more than happy to have a follow-up conversation on this. So before I go to Amber, um, Gavin, I have a quick question for you. Uh, a while ago, you mentioned about, you know, uh, the importance of having, you know, uh, the culture of collaboration in the context of a threat intelligence scenario. Do you think, you know, uh, employees training is equally important? This actually uh, resonates with what Andrew Fawcett has mentioned a while ago. Yes, absolutely, Norris. Uh, the human element uh, is key in this, uh, and the more training that uh, companies can provide to staff uh, to raise self-awareness and, and, and actually more detailed training um, is, in my view, the most important proactive measure any organisation can make. Invest in your staff. Uh, and it could save you in the long run. Excellent. Okay, so let us go, or perhaps switch, to the data protection world. Uh, the reason why we actually embed the data protection component in this webinar is just to ensure that the barren market should regard cyber security and data protection as one uh, kind of program rather than a separate program because in my experience, when whenever we actually look into global organizations, governance structure, or perhaps the budget, or perhaps the strategy, uh, typically, you know, it, it has two, you know, elements. The first is cyber has its own budget, cyber has its own people, and then privacy has its own budget, own resource, and own people. But when it comes to integrating, and as well as working together, this is actually where the challenge is. So. What we would like to share with all of you for the Barring audience and the GCC region is that when it comes to operationalizing uh, data protection uh, activities, 
what we learned from the global projects that we delivered is on data inventory. Even though in the current uh, Bahrain uh, law doesn't say anything about it, but what intrigued me so far is what Andrew Foster mentioned about transparency, because when we talk about transparency, it's very broad. If let's say there's a breach, one of the key auditable documents that most regulators in the EU or perhaps in the US would like to see is data inventory dashboard, or in the GDPR language, we call it a record of processing activities on, on the Article 30 of GDPR. So Amber, can you walk through with the audience why data inventory and is it important? Sure, Noah. Thanks. So, hello, everyone. I'm Amber Gosney. I'm a senior director in the London Privacy and Cyber Risk Advisory Team. Uh, I'm also a U.S. BARD attorney and a certified privacy professional. Uh, I work with our team primarily as a, a project manager to, to help organizations implement compliance programs specifically using technology. So, I have a, a lot of experience in this area. Uh, so, I definitely want to talk about the data inventory, which is really a building block of privacy programs. Programs. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, but yes, building on what Andrew said initially, especially, you know, how can we be transparent about our, our data protection or our data collection and use practices? Or how do we get information about our relationships uh, that we have with our various vendors who might be controllers and processors? Well, we really need a, a map of that process or of those processes. And one thing that we've learned from our global clients, as Norris was mentioning, that those first complying with the EU's GDPR and later looking at California privacy uh, is that even when the regulation doesn't require an inventory, it's just functionally impossible to really address all the risk and regulatory elements without this kind of process. So, and as Nora said, this, this documentation also really helps build a, out a powerful story for regulators. So there is a lot of benefit uh, to mapping out all of the data collection and use processes. If we can go to the next slide. Great. So, there are a couple of things that are the really two main elements that are the building block of these inventories, which are assets and processing activities. So assets are really quite straightforward. They're just our various pieces of infrastructure, our hardware, our software uh, that the business uses in our sort of everyday activities. Now processing activities, those are a little bit trickier. Those are our large scale, data collection and use activities, and they may touch across all different kinds of infrastructure. So these can be processes like payroll, email marketing, e-commerce, e uh, employee onboarding, anything that's a, a large scale process, that's gonna be what we consider a, a processing activity. If we can go to the next slide. So this is just a pictorial representation of how assets and processing activities sort of interrelate. And this is what's known as a many-to-many -many relationship, as in there can be many processes that cross many assets and vice versa. So in this picture, in the yellow, we have uh, a couple example business processes. And then in the blue, those are a couple examples of assets or our infrastructure. So we can see how uh, one asset supports multiple different business processes. Now for our clients, most of them are able to pretty easily identify their assets. Uh, you know, it's much more straightforward to sort of have IT take a look at all of their um, infrastructure and their licenses and sort of pull that together. Uh, what's a lot more challenging is to put together those business processes. And that's something we do uh, facilitate our clients with is to help identify those processes. And the reason that so important is that if you're just looking at your assets, you're really only getting part of the picture. So for example, you know, all the wonderful monitoring in the world of an asset uh, doesn't prevent a breach scenario if you print out items and leave them somewhere. So understanding where you might be sending data in a, you know, manual format, that, that's really quite important. So if we can go to the next slide. So to build out this kind of um, map, there are, there are various tools that are available. 
We've definitely had clients who started very simply using uh, Excel and SharePoint, but over time, it's really beneficial to have some kind of tool to facilitate the process. Uh, we're actually technology agnostic in terms of privacy tools, so we're we're very much uh, constantly vetting these and working with a variety of partners. So these are just some kind of high level pictures of what the various tools fall into. And I like to think of it as there are these two main buckets. So on the one hand, we have survey tools. So survey tools are, are kind of what they sound like. They allow us to send out a questionnaire through our organization and get data from, from various uh, stakeholders throughout the business and then organize that data into a coherent fashion. Now, conversely, scanning tools, these are going to connect to various pieces of infrastructure, and they're going to provide a much more detailed view of the personal data that that piece of infrastructure contains. So those are our, our two big buckets of tools. And then there are uh, some tools that are hybrids that maybe do a, a bit of both of these services. So those are our kind of primary uh, tools that are used in this space. If we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> I think the challenge when looking at these tools, though, in the sales context is they're, is they're described as kind of providing the same outcome. Uh, and that's really not uh, quite accurate. So they, they do lean towards different purposes and have different sort of pros and cons. So a survey tool is going to be beneficial in that it's going to give you a full picture across both your assets and your processing activities. So this is really more ideal for including elements that are more legal in nature, like those, uh, the grounds for processing, for example, the legal grounds. Um, in terms of infrastructure, these tend to be cloud-based tools, so they're not going to require much of a lift in terms of, of setup. Uh, usually it's just sort of a turning it on and then a day or two it's ready to go. These also have a much more sort of one-cost licensing fee. Now, the drawback is that it really does require participation for the quality of your information. So. Uh, you have to kind of have a project management approach in using these. Now, conversely, a scanning tool is really going to focus on the assets. So this is not going to be uh, something that, that covers the processing activities as well. And these tools are designed more to help fulfill things like consumer or data subject rights or help with projects like data minimization and records management. So here the picture is more limited, but it's going to give you potentially greater detail. But it's not going to be the area where you track your legal elements. Um, now, these also are going to have a much heavier lift from IT, and it's going to uh, require them to necessitate connections with the various pieces of infrastructure to the tool. So that is also... Um, it's going to be a different pricing model as well, and it's usually going to be priced on either the data volume or the number of connections. So that can be more costly than the straightforward licensing fee. So that's sort of how those two tools um, are, are pros and cons. If we can go to the next slide. So generally our clients, they begin with a survey tool because they need to understand at least sort of their, their broad picture before they think about turning to a, a more detailed view. And really the data inventory processes is good for that, later identifying things that you might want to need a, a deeper dive into. Uh, but I think the key for using these tools, and, and I won't go into every piece of this workflow, but really we're not using any of these tools out of the box. Uh, it's important to know that it's, it's really key to customize. And that's one thing we look for in our vetting process is to make sure that we can customize these for our clients. And what I mean by that is we wanna make sure that we can adjust all of the questions and the data elements to be reflective of things like multiple jurisdictions, uh, industry specific term terminology, or get into specific risk areas or exemptions. So uh, just for example, clients that focus on e-commerce are going to have really different needs from someone who does clinical trials. So we'll, we want to make sure that we're able to capture those, those elements uh, very, very accurately. But in terms of a broad process for, for using a survey tool overall, what we do is help you identify what needs to go into the inventory, customize the questions, uh, train those stakeholders who will answer, and then launch that to the larger organization. 
If we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so once we get that information back, we engage in something really important, which is we analyze those responses. And this is where we make a lot of recommendations in terms of remediation. So sometimes that is really sort of technical in nature. We're going to to say, hey, we're, we're noticing some areas where you should really consider data minimization uh, because you've got a lot of data, it's, it's really old, it hasn't been purged, you should think about you know, doing some, some more analysis and limiting risk here. Uh, other times we might flag some things like, hey, we're seeing a lot of international transfers with this particular process. You know, I think this is something you discuss with your legal team. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of how we work with uh, Altamimi in a partnership on this type of project is, you know, in those instances, like I said, with the international transfers or things where we know that there's a real legal component, we want to float up those risks and then the lawyers can have a more in-depth analysis and strategic session and provide meaningful advice. So sometimes that's going to necessitate an update to a contract. Uh, other times it might mean an, an update to a policy policy or procedure. So we work very closely in those instances to make sure that, you know, all of these elements are accurately reflecting the data practices in hand. Next slide. I'm not going to read all of these, but this is just kind of an example of, of the kind of thinking that goes into targeting your tool needs. So really the most important are, are number one and number 10 here, which is, uh, you know, what problem are we trying to solve? What's the functionality we're looking for? And then finally, uh, what are we doing with in terms of budget? Do we have a, a pre-allocated budget and so we need to make something sort of fit into that roadmap? Or are we trying to build a business case for a purchase? So those are the kinds of scenarios where we're very used to scoping with our clients. Uh, I realized that we're coming to the end of our time and want to leave a few minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Amber, for the comprehensive and impressive you know walkthrough on data inventory so we have a question that we can uh, pick up uh, so in the interest of time we have remaining questions which uh unfortunately we can't actually answer because of time constraint but uh we will aim to answer that uh after this uh, webinar so the question is given this COVID 19 uh, uh landscape uh what would be the recommendations for the business to uh, do or to procure uh, off-shell privacy software to comply with the upcoming data privacy law requirements. I think there's two angles of this question. One is for Andrew Fawcett for Altamimi uh, in the context of Bahrain organization. And then uh, another part is for you, Amber, and I can actually add uh, additional uh, if need be. Andrew Fawcett, to you, please. Thanks, Norris. The, the... In terms of, I mean, it, it does have to be a case-by-case case, uh, analysis. And I mean, in terms of um, whether, I mean, it's not necessarily a software solution per se. I mean, what the law is is requiring is um, organisational. This is how, how you um, run your business in terms of its collection of, of information and things like that, and then the technical solutions. And um, so, as, as I said before, the in terms of the law, I mean, the your requirements um, under the law, it, it is offset by some understanding of what the purpose is, um, the, the particular state of the art, and, and the con context of the, of the processing. But there is an obligation on businesses right now to put on appropriate mechanisms, and you do have to factor that in as part of your costing now. Um, I mean, I guess, I uh, Amber, if you can help me in terms of um, sort of day-to-day uh, um, -day practice things that people can look at. Sure. Um... Well, I think if we're best practices is is really just sort of making sure that we we have a good understanding of what we're doing, uh, even if if the technology isn't there yet, if we're not ready to 
to invest in, in tech, then at least starting to catalog um, how we're handling data, I think is, is really the key for, for any business um, crisis or, or no. Um, because I think you can't put anything effective into place. You can't be transparent. You can't be, um, you know, negotiating your contracts properly with without having a full sense of, of where you're going from the business perspective. And I think um, what we found is that in the course of these projects, people start talking more and more to each other and in, engaging in a way they hadn't previously. Uh, you know, I think business units tend to silo quite a bit. And so when you're forced to sort of uh, collaborate around what our, what our data practices are, it, it opens up better dialogue within an organization, which leads to better data handling practices overall. I don't know if that quite answered the, the question. Norris, did that get towards right. what we were? Yeah. yeah, I think that really complements uh, Andrew Fawcett's uh, answer. So I just want to add that um, for organizations which have the budget to purchase or uh, offset uh, or off-shelf kind of privacy software, not just privacy software, but also any kind of software, technology tool and platform, you have to ask these two key questions back to the vendor. The first is, have you actually done uh, privacy by design or data protection impact assessment in your tool? If you have, all right, demonstrate to us that you have done that. Second, what about security by design? This is actually where an element where uh, some of the vendors are missing. The reason is uh, it's actually it's very important to be part of the due diligence procurement process wherever you are around the world, whether you are in the GCC region or in the UK or in the US or in Asia. Those are actually the two key questions that you need to ask you know, to the vendors. Uh, they might actually claim that, oh, everything is there, everything is on the privacy notice, privacy policy, uh, but you need to stress test that to them so that whenever your organization really uh, use the software, okay, it really complies with the necessary DPIA or perhaps you know, security by design requirements. So uh, I hope that answers uh, the question to the questioner. I know that uh, we have uh, other questions that we hope to actually answer, but in the interest of time, we will actually, you know, pick up the question. So ultimately, me and the team will be able to uh, reach out to the questioner. And if you have any questions on cybersecurity and data privacy, more from the operational side, the governance side, and then as well as improvement side, please feel free to reach out to the Ankara team. Uh, thank you so much to Andy Cutley, Gavin McKay, and Amber Gosney, and most importantly to the Alta Mimi team, to Andrew Fawcett for having Ankura on this particular joint uh, virtual masterclass workshop. And I really hope that all of you find this uh, virtual masterclass workshop very helpful. And uh, we hope to see you in the future webinar. Stay safe and take care. Thank you very much, all.